Dear Professor Ahmed, dear Professor Kupira Anu, distinguished colleagues and friends, thank you so much for your very well warm uh, welcome. I feel very proud and privileged to be here with you today. I feel privileged and proud because I'm surrounded by all of you and particularly by my family, Jan, it's Agustina, Hrisa, my father-in-law, Dr. George Economo, my nephew Filipos, my nephew Maximus, and my brother-in-law Noftos. All of us uh, travel from different parts of the world. Jans came from Qatar, and uh, my father-in-law, I think, is his first trip uh, to London. So we are, we are all very proud. And as uh, Anna said, uh, um, I am the child of a merchant marine captain, so travel is in my blood. And maybe that was the thing that led me to do international business, because everything in our home was uh, international. And uh, our current home is very international uh, as well. So I hope that you will see this trip and travel and journey that I took since I was uh, 18 years old when I joined the university where I discovered uh, international business. Thank you so much in advance for being here and I hope that I will keep you interested in what I'm saying. And at the point I may borrow my reading glasses from Yanis because I don't have them with me and I won't be able to So Bakar. Uh, outline the theme of uh, the uh, of uh, the lecture, and but I have to say something about uh, this uh, very long uh, English and Greek sentence, which was inspired by the late uh, economist and uh, prime minister of Greece, Xenophonzo Lotas, who gave one of his his primary speech. I think it was uh, in the UN, and it was all in Greek using English words. So <laughs> I was inspired by him because these are words that we use in the English uh, vocabulary and uh, their roots are in Greece, so we can see the filtering of civilizations. So the synchronous economical, ecumenical, sorry, organization is the multinational corporation. So let's see what we have learned all these years about that. And um, how did it all start? Well, it was back in Athens when um, I entered the Department of Economics at the Kapodistria National University. So my background is economics. But uh, as I said, being the daughter of a merchant marine captain and of a very international family, I got really intrigued when I entered the class of uh, Professor Tassius Yanitsis, who later became a minister of labor in uh, the Greek government. And he was the first person at that time in the Greek, in a very, let's say, conservative Greek university environment that taught us about industrial uh, organization and uh, technological transformation. At the center of that was the multinational corporation. Immediately I felt intrigued. I said, OK, this is what I would like to do. I enjoyed economics, but I enjoyed so much this, uh, this uh, element of international entity. When I was entering his class, I felt that I was traveling myself and I was discovering all these new worlds through the multinational. And there was another person there. It was Professor Luca Cazzelli, again a minister. In Greece, you first become a professor and then you become a politician, all right? <laughs> so, so, not yet. <laughs> so. Uh, Luca Catelli, uh, she was a fresh professor coming from Princeton, US, with her modern ideas, a role model for us, young ladies at that time, not so many female professors. She was fantastic. She was actually the first professor that asked us to, to, uh, to get to know our names. I know it may sound amazing, but at that time we were shocked, culturally shocked. She wanted to know how. Uh, what were our names and what were our interests and if we spoke different languages. So for me, Luca has been a real role model and I had the opportunity to meet them again two or three years ago when we are all together in a meeting uh, discussing about the future of uh, the Greek economy and I told them ex exactly what I'm telling you today, that these two people were my role models, they influenced me and they basically, without even knowing, they shaped what I'm doing now. And uh, once I finished, obviously, my undergrad uh, degree in economics, then I w we started looking for our uh, uh, master's degree. In Greece, we didn't have master's degree at that time. It was uh, the late uh, 80s. So we did it the traditional way, which meant send mails, not emails, to universities and inquiring uh, about uh, uh, potential courses, and particularly the UK for the Greeks was the place to go, <laughs> at least in economics and social sciences. So Reading came up. Obviously, I asked also some of my professors there. And Reading was the place. And uh, I was very fortunate to get accepted 
because later I, I heard, because the, the guy that, threw, that reviewed my application was the late uh, Professor Georgi Arnopoulos. So my grade was 7.1 out of 10. It was a good grade. It was both very good. And Yanopoulos had set the minimum of 7, although the, the minimum was 6.5 in general for, for the for British University to get us accepted. So I marginally entered, and I, I, I learned about that a long time ago when I was very familiar with the environment, so people start sharing uh, things with me. So I was so fortunate to enter Reading, because Reading is, or was, that time, and Bob can correct me obviously, the cradle of international business. It was a unique department set up by the late Professor John Danny and surrounded by people like Bob Pierce, John Caldwell, Peter Buckley passed by, Mark Carson, to name but a few. I know that I missed a lot of them. And also it had fantastic PhD students. So I was there learning about the multinational from the best, from the ones that basically they have set up the field. So I had a fantastic course uh, on the multinational. The first semester was taught by Professor Mike Watterson. I think he then he moved to Warwick. He did us more economics and I.O., industrial organization. Then Bob Pierce came to my life by teaching us the multinational as I developed it as a researcher. And uh, before we took a photo outside, and obviously Bob was part of this family photo because Bob is now a member of our family, of the, this huge Greek family of ours. So it was an exciting academic environment. I was so, so thrilled to be there. And meeting Bob meant that I had to do a PhD. It wasn't original design for me to do a PhD. The family had not uh, provided for that. For the family had provided to do a master's degree. So I shared all this with uh, Bob. And Bob accepted to, to help me, even financial, because he gave me research assistance with job so I could keep my thing going in the UK and not going back to Greece. So, we started working with them, and as Anna said, I took this fantastic trip with my dad. Basically, we crossed the Atlantic. We didn't fly to Argentina, but we crossed the Atlantic. I was traveling with him for two months. I crossed the Mar de la Plata in Buenos Aires. I spent a month in, uh, in uh, Brazil. It was fantastic, so I got to love Brazil, and I, I discovered the BRICS at the time. <laughs> so I wanted to do my PhD thesis on Brazil. But Bob was generous enough to give me different uh, research, uh, let's say, assistantships, but the money to do a field, field research at Brazil at the time was too much, so we settled for something more realistic. The topic was the same, it was uh, multinational strategies and the roles of subsidiaries and innovation strategies, but we settled for something more realistic, and that was Europe. So we focused on the UK, Portugal, Greece, and Belgium. Uh, we called the north and south divide of Europe in order to understand how things were were done at the time. The PhD finished in 1994 and it was defended in 1995. I started as part-time. I wanted to travel a lot, so I visited the US where Janis was. And actually, I got an offer by his university. Janis is a grad. He got his PhD in chemical engineers at Johns Hopkins. And I was offered to do a PhD at Johns Hopkins, but it was economics. And I didn't want to do at that time economics, although it was uh, Bella Balassa there who was doing development economics. So I, I stuck to Reading because I wanted to do international uh, business. But also I took some positions in, uh, as a trainee, as a stagiaire, as we say, in, uh, in Luxembourg and Belgium. So all this came together. And one day Bob called me back because we had this great ESRC project. And eventually I joined him back to Reading. So at the same time, we were working on the ESRC project, and I was completing uh, the PhD. And actually benefited from both a lot. And Bob was a fantastic advisor because he put up with all my tantrums and all my insecurities uh, and everything. <laughs> yes, working on two projects and uh, and having very strict deadlines and rediscovering things like I discovered econometrics at the time and I wanted to do everything perfectly. It meant long, long hours and long a lot of insecurities. But but an advisor like Bob allowed you to ask questions. And even when I, s I said I will ask you a very stupid question, and he said there are no stupid questions. So. That's what I say to my students now. There's no stupid, stupid question. That's what I tell my daughters as well. So, and we started working immediately. So the, the structure, as you're going to see of this lecture, is how we viewed the multinational through our research. Because I, I believe that what we have done at Reading, particularly with the work with Bob and all my <coughs> colleagues, we, we contributed to the analysis of the, of the institution. 
we just don't, didn't repeat what other people were saying. I was very fortunate to start working with him in the environment of Reading at that time. So the first paper came immediately after the master's degree. It was 1990. So we started working together. And it was this one, the host country determinants of UK, FDI, and exports, and analysis of develop and developing country. And as you can uh, understand, there was, it was an economics-oriented paper. We tested things econometrically. We had uh, different variables. But what was interesting? It was that we could use very traditional, let's say, applied economic, econometric models, but we could filter them, both of us are economists, with the ideas of international business. And that's the beauty of the field, and we'll come back later to that. So the theme that emerged out of this paper was the subsidiary roles. And now you may allow me to take off my hat, because I can see clearly. So, and what we did there, by looking at something at a very macroeconomic level was that we set, as I said, the agenda for uh, the multinational corporations as diversified networks of production through their subsidiaries. We tried to analyze how GDPs and GDP per capita and unit labor costs in different economies can really explain uh, the multinational from a micro point of view, from a firm level and not from the center, but from the subsidiaries, because all the research at the time was mostly macroeconomic research, and uh, the center of analysis, even now, actually, was the headquarters. Then, throughout the PhD, I just picked some of the papers. I don't mention all the papers, what I consider that were seminal anyway. Uh, we had the PhD pa period papers. There were two 1994 papers, and again, it was the internationalization of research development of Jap by Japanese enterprises and the host country determinants of the market strategy of U.S. companies overseas subsidiaries. In the second paper, you see explicitly where we're getting at. We place the emphasis by using standard, let's say, uh, published data on the role of subsidiaries, and we talked about strategies. At that time, I think we were among the first papers in the literature that we dared to do that. And it wasn't always well accepted, because you understand that, and this is a pressure that we all feel, that we try to filter our fields with different elements, and you try to publish, <coughs> and then, obviously, these were sent, to, let's say, to more economic-oriented papers, but they were not, uh, journal, sorry, but they were not well accepted, because the theories we were using were coming from a different <coughs> sub-discipline. So for us, economics was our mother discipline, obviously, and still is. And uh, what? We, it was analyzed there and through the paper on uh, the development of Japanese enterprises, the R&D element. So we have subsidiaries, R&D, and strategies. That's my life academically, basically, around these three words. We coined the term creative transition, where we talked about the corporate evolution of the MNC, which is related inextricably with the development of national capability. And basically, we set the roots on discussing issues that are related to policy making. So the subsidiaries, or the, the firm as it develops, is not irrelevant to where it develops, what it develops. Again, that was innovation coming from economics, because even nowadays, if you read some of the some of the papers of leading economists, like uh, James Mark Cousin uh, and uh, the economic geography papers, um, again, the, the emphasis is placed on the center, the headquarters, and the strategy basically is defined by the headquarters. As in IB, uh, we say slightly a different story. And uh, let's see how the two intermix. After finishing the PhD, I had uh, different job offers. Again, the job offers are the path I followed in Greece always, always leads to a political uh, position. I avoid it. I, I, I have rejected so far tiny political positions, not top political positions. But I entered uh, the center of planning of the economy, which was uh, the research uh, hand, let's say, of the Ministry of Finance. And after that, I was uh, recruited by the Athens University of Economics and Business. I spent there 10 years. And uh, so a lot of our research came from this period in uh, Athens. Uh, in 1996, we discussed uh, the technological uh, competitiveness of Japanese multinationals, the European dimension. That was a book, actually. And um, in 1998, we had a paper that we feel both Bob and I, so far the papers are written with, uh, mostly with Bob, on individu individualism and interdependence in the technological development of multinationals, the strategic positioning of, of R&D overseas laboratories. So what we explored there 
was that heterogeneity is not necessarily bad. You have to accommodate for that. It's what in economics we say you have to accommodate for your transaction costs. Once you accommodate for that, then you can have some source of creativity. So you don't have to homogenize everything. You just need to manage it better and to be open-minded enough to see that heterogeneity is there and don't try to suppress it. As I say to my students, uh, when we deal with uh, issues, when I teach about the economics of the multinational, because this is the core course that uh, I inherited from Reading, and, I, inher and I, I, I taught for 10 years in the Athens University of Economics and Business, is that sometimes, I mean, since we are doing empirical economics, the, our ideas were limited by the access to the data that we had. But our ideas expanded because besides uh, quantitatively published data, databases, we explored the qualitative world through surveys and questionnaires. And that allowed us to get into the black box and understand how the, the multinational evolves and understand the subsidiaries and understand that an element to, to the competitiveness of the firm is how it handles knowledge, how it handles its R&D, its research and development. And one of the first things that also we put forward, following obviously work that Bob and Satwinter Singh, for instance, were doing at Reading, was that R&D is not necessarily centralized. Yes, it's a unique resource, but in order to maintain it and make it grow, you can also decentralize or make it more networked. So the Athens University of Economics and Business period had plenty of papers. These two created, followed the evolution of our work, made our work, or at least my work was working with Bob at the time, made more mature. But also at the same time, I had my first PhD students. And with them, I was able to further explore uh, the ideas that we were developing. And actually, with the two PhD students that I worked at the time, they followed different paths, showing how IB can bring together things. One followed the macroeconomic aspects of the foreign direct investment, and the other person followed the, uh, the way we, we've analyzed the international business strategic mode. So both of them, PhDs at the same department, which was the Department of International Economics, International European, uh, International Economics and European Integration. And uh, so it was the right place to be at that time. Plus, it was the only department at that time when I joined that had the course on the multinational. And when the late professor, Georgia, uh, Thodor Zhirakopoulos invited me to teach there. I was so surprised and so happy that there was a course there on the multinationals. So that was the evolution at that time, getting to understand the, the institution much better. Definitely it was ecumenical because it had expanded in various countries. It had so many activities. And most importantly, what we shown with our work was that it wasn't only using as uh, the, 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 the inputs or the factors of production that were produced at home, but it was generating new factors of production in different countries. And I feel that sometimes this is the main, let's say, element of, uh, of debating, even within our own discipline, where this notion of centralization still holds very strong, but also with our mother discipline, which is economics slash international economics. Our most cited paper, at least my most cited paper, is uh, the 1999 paper, which is a research policy paper on the overseas R&D and strategic evolution of the MNCs, evidence from laboratories in the UK. And there we discussed about global innovation strategy. So we put everything together, going from central to decentralized, addressing the roles of overseas R&D and, uh, and uh, the roles of uh, different roles of labs. So we didn't see R&D as a homogeneous activity. FDI is not a homogeneous activity, and we discussed about global innovation strategies. And um, is where basically the unit, which the R&D units, where they are reformulating the strategy. And you can see how, once we understand that, not only basically through this paper, there are plenty of other papers from other distinguished colleagues that they have developed this sort of analysis, you can see the impact the multinational can have on the different aspects that we discussed on the theme, educationally. Just to give you an example, which I always enjoy giving anyway, because we say that R&D is not homogeneous. So as we, I'm going to show later, there's basic research and applied research and development. And once we understand that companies do not set up in one location their R&D labs, so they have a choice to set up, assume, three different types of R&D labs in different countries. The impact with education is enormous. 
Basic research means you need good PhD programs. How are you going to fit your basic research labs? With expats only? No, definitely not. So once we attract foreign direct investment that they are having good R&D labs in our home countries, then it means that we have positive spillover effects potentially in different R&D, in different PhD programs. Once you attract companies that they do, let's say, adaptation type of R&D work, then you develop different disciplines. For instance, you may develop, you need good business schools where you need to develop good marketeers, accountants, etc., strategies. So where they set up, for instance, it affects enormously our educational systems. Since multinationals, as we're going to see, are, and as we know, are major players, we like it or not, in all aspects of our lives. I guess another nice example is what if we see ourselves, what we are wearing today, what, what we were drinking probably, is a multinational behind that. And if it's not, probably a company working with a multinational. So all these were the concepts. The concepts were the creative transition, the global innovation strategies, interdependent individualism, creative transition, the subsidiary roles, and the overseas R&D laboratories. How did we implement them? We implement them in different manners. So we had the, a series of papers. I had a series of papers with my co-authors in general like regional studies or applied economics or chapters in books with uh, <coughs> distinguished editors like Jean-Louis Mucchielli or T.A. Mayer. That was uh, my Sorbonne time, uh, visiting time then. And uh, journals like uh, International Business Review. So you see a mix. IB journals, applied economic journals, and obviously chapters in books where we are in good companies of distinguished uh, colleagues. How did we implement them? The first paper was an expansion strategy of Greek firms in, in the Balkan region. Again, that was back in 2000, in 2000 but uh, Greece was a major investor in the Balkans. And now it's the talk of the town because we the policymakers in Greece place emphasis on uh, growth. Growth comes through foreign direct investment. They completely neglect the Greek multinationals. They saw what they were doing abroad as depriving resources from their Greek activities. This is a, this is a, this is a common false statement that many people do, not only in Greece. They believe that if you invest abroad, you deprive your home country from uh, vital resources like, or like uh, employment uh, position. But that's a complete mistake. Again, it depends, I would say. Not a complete mistake, but it depends. So we, we analyze that, and we implement the different strategies of subsidiaries. Then we talked about the evolution of US outward direct investment in the Pacific Rim. I thought that with this paper, which was with uh, my PhD student at the time, Fragis uh, Kospilipeos and also Bob, was quite innovative, because we looked at the, the Pacific Rim uh, uh, group of, uh, of the OECD, which was Korea, Japan, Australia and New Zealand, and uh, it was relatively under-investigated. And under the influence of a very good colleague as well, Tammy Ragmon, we sort of um, concept put in action the concept of neighborhoods, which I'm going to discuss a little bit later. The empirical evidence of strategic behavior of US is within the framework of di diversified, dynamic differentiated networks, subsidiary roles in US and So you see the different contexts from Greece, to Japan, to Korea, to the US. And the technology sourcing uh, in multinational enterprise and the role of subsidiaries and empirical investigation, which again, I think the, the bottom line then was uh, Greece with another uh, student of ours, uh, uh, Dimitris Manolopoulos. After 2006, I joined uh, the Copenhagen Business School. I will explain later when I talk about uh, the people and institutions that influence my life why I left uh, Athens, but I went to a fantastic place, um, Copenhagen Business School at the time, the Department of International Economics and Management. Since we all like uh, rankings, uh, the department was number three in the, the world after Leeds, Hong Kong, and, and us at the time, in uh, IB, based on the different rankings. So I was among colleagues that I usually used to meet in conferences, good friends basically that I knew since ever, since I was a PhD student. So it felt immediately very, very comfortable being there. And um, some of the areas that we developed through our work was policy making, was on policy making, because we put the concepts to work 
in the context of national systems of innovation and how multinationals interact with this. So we saw the interaction in multinational host country environment where this is stressed and the different aspects. And we also revisited some of the core theories, at least in IB. And one of them was uh, Heimer, Stephen Heimer, one of the L central figures in understanding international business. And the paper was to almost see the world hierarchy and strategies in Heimer's view of the multinational. And I always say it's a little bit unfair because when Heimer wrote his thesis was, was a young guy. And he basically saw everything. So to come a little bit later and say to almost see, not only us, but all of us that sort, I mean, critically assess his work, I think he was a brilliant guy who was fantastic. But we went beyond his PhD years. We went well into its Marxist years. And I think it was Susan Saunders that I read somewhere that said he's probably the only Mar Marxist taught in business school. So Heimer made a, yes? In IB, at least. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very proud, I mean, to teach uh, Heimer because uh, he, 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 he was a brilliant mind. Uh, so we implement that in policy making and in theory, and the emphasis there is where organization structure and strategy are visited because what we saw in there is hierarchy and the territory are two different organizational models in uh, the multinational, and these are related with the different uh, let's say locations where the multinationals uh, invest. So the Copenhagen Business School, as I said, I was in a thriving environment, very exciting. Uh, it, I mean, uh, this is this is something that I one one thing that I really enjoyed in Copenhagen uh, was the interaction uh, with my colleagues, and the interaction wouldn't come in formal forms necessarily. It would come in completely informal forms. The fact that we were gathered all together around the table to have uh, lunch or dinner, and we would debate about uh, everything, and. Uh, we, you know, uh, the structure of uh, the floors was fantastic because we had kitchens, fully uh, implemented kitchens and integrated in our, uh, in our uh, office space. And if you open the fridge, you would find, as Nikolai would put, a good bubbly and a glass of wine that would uh, finish our working day. When, I, when, uh, when we lived in the UAE, and I taught in a couple of universities there, I don't think that we could have the bubbly in the UAE, no. But in Copenhagen, yes, we did. And when I was receiving, when I was still in the UAE, I was receiving emails from by my department at that time saying, please join us for our Friday glass of wine. I said, oh my god. I was telling that Jan said, I don't think you have these sort of things, because Jan served as a provost of graduate studies in uh, university in uh, the UAE. So I don't think that he would encourage this sort of uh, emails amongst that. But in Copenhagen, it's Denmark, it's Copenhagen. We, we used to have these sort of things. And it was nice because uh, basically we could discuss everything freely. And uh, this is something that I enjoyed. And I think it's reflected in our work as well because two new elements emerged basically. The small country elements, which was vital in IB, the BRICS, obviously, the new context was the new countries that were emerging, the new types of multinationals, not only big from the core OECD countries, but also from peripheral countries, not necessarily OECD, smaller economies. And also, we are reversing the paradigm. The ones that they used to receive foreign direct investment, which were the emerging economies, now become parents of multinationals. And even now, obviously now, it's one of the core elements in the agenda of, of analyzing international business. And uh, we have the 2012 uh, Journal of World Business paper with colleagues from Copenhagen on the strategic complexity and global expansion and empirical study of newcomer multinational corporations from small countries, or the three eyes paper, as we used to call it uh, informally, because it was Israel, Ireland, and Iceland. And why the three eyes? Because if you check the, the top 10, let's say, countries that were rigorous investors, other things being equal rel in relative terms of broad work among this top 10. So alongside the US and China, we had three small countries that they were making a difference as investors abroad. And this intrigued us to investigate how they did it. <coughs> what concluded, let's say, not really concluded, but what put an, an emphasis on, uh, on, on, on our work or put it everything together was basically this. 
the strategic development of multinational subsidiaries and innovation, where Bob used to call these books our greatest hits. So this is uh, the latest of our greatest hits. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's an edited volume of the work that we have done with our co-authors. But what is interesting is that we have developed and analyzed from an economics policy making point of view these structures, these different structures, the multi-domestic hierarchy, the network hierarchy, and the heterarchy. And what these structures reflect, they reflect, how, first of all, how the multinational is organized. So in a multi-domestic, for instance, hierarchy, we have the center and we have homogeneous subsidiaries. In the network hierarchy, we have, again, the center and almost homogeneous subsidiaries. And in the heterarchy, we have, should I say chaos, creative chaos. And what it shows there is how different organizational structures obviously develop different relationships <coughs> with their respective environments. And when we talk about respective environments, we talk about the host countries. So in the first two, for instance, the core inputs of creativity, which is basically for us innovation, and not only from the manufacturing point of view, but creativity in general, are maintained at home, and they are developed at home, and then they are spread in uh, the different, uh, in the different uh, parts of the network, of the overseas network through the subsidiaries. But when we have heterarchy, we have different organizational, let's say, leaders in different parts of uh, the m &E group, which means subsidiaries can take up some leading roles. And uh, in order to survive in a heterarchy, you need to have very good coordination uh, techniques. Or it's, 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 as I said before, the transaction cost can be very high. And that's why we don't have, as I say also to my students, in the Fortune 500 leading companies, there's only one at the top. So very few can manage to organize that effectively. And all the things that you saw before, the creative transition, interdependent individualism, is reflected in these three different elements, which is reflected in the very first chapter of our uh, book. The other thing that we concluded our book was the global innovation strategies and the new product concept. And this sketch here, this diagram, basically says everything about what I've been working all my academic life until now. And uh, it shows basically, this is a multinational, assume that this is a multinational group, very simple in small boxes and, and, and letters. And uh, on the top, what you see there as IILs or IILs A, B, and C, it's a type of a research laboratory, which does basic research. And uh, what you see here, the RPMs, is a type of a subsidiary that develops products. And this is a type of lab that does development. And this is another type of subsidiary, the RPS, that basically supplies inputs. It's a supplier. And this is another type of, of, uh, of a lab that uh, does adaptation. So everything is built together. And what you can see is, first of all, that there are so many different sources of knowledge. It's naive to think that U.S. multinationals, for instance, since the U.S. is a big market and you can find basically very uh, sophisticated knowledge inputs there, good universities, good engineering schools, etc., etc., they will track down all their knowledge there. No. They will try to find bits and pieces of basic research all over. And another good example, and comes from the family, is uh, what Yanis has been doing in uh, his research lab in Democritus, where he has been developing, and he can say it much better, so... Um, a part, an aspect of, of the simulation elements of the pearl. The pearl is the largest gas liquefier that Shell is building in Qatar. And as Yanni says, it's as big as Central Park and is the only thing with uh, um, the, one of the very few things that a satellite can view from Greece. So Shell trusted Yanis and his team in Democritus in Greece to do a vital part of their basic research element that will control the actual work, the flows that will happen in the pearl. So different sources of IIL. It doesn't have to come Shell, let's say, from the Netherlands. Shell has Delft, which is a fantastic university, but they get also good resources from elsewhere. What does it mean, for instance, this small example, that Yanis employs good PhD students in Greece? And uh, it has an impact on the research record of his host institution there, Democritus, because it means that it's a good research institution, so more projects will come. There will be more interaction with industry. 
and the development, as I said before, of stronger, for instance, PhD programs in the particular area, like chemical engineering. So all this can filter into a home, pan, a home country parent lab, which in the past used to do the core R&D work, but now it more or less coordinates. And the new product concept can come from different parts of the subsidiaries, different subsidiaries in different countries, at different letters A, B, C, or D, D talk about different uh, countries. So as you can see, we don't have a very strict vertical integration in one country. We can see what now is very fashionable to discuss, the different value chains, how they expand around the globe. So country D, host, X subsidiary, X lab, and research is done in country C, and a bit of research is done in country A, but the markets that we are interested in throwing our products is A and C. So the globe is very, very heterogeneous. And the multinational is not working in a strict vertical way that we used to think about it. It's scattered all over. And this institution has to coordinate its activities. And um, Copenhagen was out in uh, July. I came here on the 18th, interviewed on the 19th. I have to say something. When I went to the airport and they called me, I said, I didn't get the job. I don't think that I made a good impression. I was very disappointed. I think they must have hated me because sometimes I think I come a little bit direct and not very maybe polite. So I apologize if some of you see me as very direct. So I said, definitely not. So when Vakar called, I was so happy. What did I do? I jumped up and down, <laughs> that's what Krisha is saying. I was so happy I was coming here, an exciting place. And, uh, and when people were asking me, why did you leave Copenhagen and come to Middlesex, which is a question I don't like. Because the six months I've been here in Middlesex, I've been doing so many things and I've been involved in so many things, even with my 20 or 50% that I haven't done for the last six years in Copenhagen. And the trust that people have shown me here, I, it's amazing. So Middlesex, yes, of course Middlesex. And we, we go like this. And with the recent appointments that we were in the committee, we, we definitely go like this. But we go like this because we have a very solid and good base. And uh, I'm very happy to be here six months later. And uh, I've been already working, obviously, with my colleagues on different projects. This is just a selection. So Costa. Costa and Lana, is with uh, Dubrovchenko, which is our PhD students. They introduced me because I'm in a learning process. The good thing being an academic is that you learn all your life. You never grow old. So they introduced me to luxury brands, and we are trying to blend IB and marketing. And we were, when we were discussing with Costa and Lana, I said, yes, of course, all the companies that they do this are multinationals. And uh, we are brave to say that we are preparing a paper with Lana that we hope that we will submit for the IBA conference that will come uh, next uh, December in, um, in Germany. The other thing that we have been doing uh, is with my colleague Kuping Lee. And we are exploring the relationship between multinational subsidiaries and distributors in China. And again, this is fascinating because Kuping has this fantastic database and experience from her PhD. And uh, she has done so far a fantastic job to code that for me so I can understand, because I don't understand obviously everything. So she translated me in, in a word that I can understand. And we are building this together. And it's, uh, I think it will come forward. And last but not least, with Yanis, and I, should ha I forgot to put the name of Christos Pitelis, who is a colleague of ours at Cambridge. Um, we are doing, this is where economics and then ex-economists come together and they blend total factor productivity and Salai Martin growth models with IB theories. And I think we have a catchy project there because we talk about subsidiaries and domestic companies and regional growth in the UK. So we compare who contributes to, to the growth. Is it FDI for indirect investment or is it domestic companies? <coughs> and again, I dare to say that we intend to, once we see how the first results go, maybe apply for a grant for this. So I'm very fortunate because immediately, and this is a sample, I was surrounded by colleagues that we could do things together. And this is some of the research, but we have done so many things already in teaching with Hong, 
and my colleagues, we reshaped uh, some of uh, the progress. It's something I promised both to Anna and Bakar when we, I was interviewed. And I think we contributed to the IB new programs, and we're going to be big hit. I'm, I'm confident on this. But also, my colleagues in other disciplines are doing fantastic jobs, that, and I can benefit from them. We're discussing also with Ine about supply chains that and multinationals. We, I, I think it's, it's an exciting place. And I can tell you this um, diversity, for me, so refreshing. And I hope that I, I, I will contribute as much as my colleagues are contributing already to me getting to know more things. So, so far you heard about host countries, transaction costs, da 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 da. And I know Marion is going to be upset because that will say, so what is to do with real life? So, real life. Horse meat scandal related to supply chains of multinationals. Why do we teach that? We are a business school. After all, we do high quality research, but we also want to benefit the society. After all, we are social sciences. And I think we forget this part, that we are there not only to make our colleagues happy with our publications, but to offer to the world and improve it. So horse meat scandal, if we go backwards to this picture, if you, whatever we have read from uh, the uh, different uh, articles in newspapers, you know, everything had to do with supply chains. Multinationals cannot control, they are so expanded that they cannot control the quality of their supply chains. It's an issue of co transaction cost coordination. And you see how this fits with our understanding of the organizational structure and also the different roles and how, what things you internalize and what things you externalize. Then, remember when uh, Prime Minister Cameron said at the point that we want to go out uh, to leave the EU, and then there was a reaction, and one of the reactions that I read at the time was by Lord Heseltine said, OK, what will happen with FDI? And I think this quote, basically, regardless which side of uh, things you may see, this is a pure economic quote. Because when you make your environment unstable or you create some instability, then you also risk not only how much, but also the quality of FDI that you are going to, to have in your country. So FDI, core of the political agenda. Because even in the UK, who has been parenting many multinationals, growth depends on foreign direct investment and multinational in the UK when we view it as a host country. Another quote that I just got uh, the other day was, FDI boosts Vietnam's economic growth. Knowing a little bit of history, you understand why FDI is important to the growth of the Vietnam. The, the minister of, I think, of, uh, of, econ of, uh, of finance in Vietnam came and said, if we want to grow, we need to have good FDI. And since I had the privilege to, um, to be part of a PhD committee of a good Vietnamese student we had uh, at Copenhagen, I can tell you that the, uh, some, in, at least in, uh, in business, a lot of PhD Vietnamese students focus on foreign direct investment. And they look at the issues that we are, have been discussing, subsidiary roles, and uh, links with suppliers, and uh, networks, and all that stuff. And last but not least, top global innovators. We talk about innovation. But who innovates in the world? It's not SMEs. We would love them to innovate, and some of them do. And once they do, they are being acquired by large multinationals. But some, this is a list, this is the top 10, let's say, of the, the 100 uh, 2012 global innovators. All of them are multinationals. At the bottom of the list, you see only two public organizations. And this is the US Defense uh, uh, and uh, the Health Department, the US Health Department. This is the only public organizations you see. The rest is private and it's multinationals. So, this was the trip through the papers, through everything. But who were the influences? And uh, of course, uh, the core influence in my life, my academic life, and my personal life, to a very great degree, was Bob, who I found at the University of Reading when he was teaching, as I said, the multinational. And basically, he influenced me as an academic. Bob is this ideal academic. He, 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 he loves doing research. And he filters his research with his interests, and he has multiple interests. He reads a lot, and his knowledge about music is fantastic. And when we discuss research, we discuss about music, and rock and roll, and jazz, and everything. And uh, of course, we have fights. So 
And, but it's, it has been a fantastic process for me. I have been learning from this person so much. And most of all, I hope that I learned to be as high, to keep his high ethos as he has kept and he has guided me all these years. So I owe him basically academically everything, not a lot, everything. Other intellectual influences through their work, some of them I met and I interacted, some of them I didn't, like the late John Dunning. In, in our book, we, we mentioned John because he was the ethical role model that we were looking. He was honest, helping his students, promoting research. He was fantastic. Stephen Heimer, I think, because he was one of the pioneers, excellent research just by the age of 25. The late Gunnar Hedland, heterarchy. And if you read his paper, you will see that most of his analysis come from ancient Greece. Raymond Vernon, Harvard University Business School, the product cycle, where he put together the evolution of location and subsidiary roles. Christopher Bartlett and the late Sumantra Goshal, Harvard Business School, USA and London Business School. This is some of the latest affiliations because these people went around, obviously. When I was reading Bartlett and Goshal's uh, Harvard Business uh, Review paper, I was fascinated because they used four case studies and they, and they coined a terminology that even nowadays that we go beyond the four case studies is still valid and uh, is being explored. Neil Hood and Stephen Young, Strathclyde University. Actually, these were the guys that I had the first job offer after my PhD at Strathclyde. Again, it was uh, with Reading at the time was core of uh, the core of IB because of Steve and uh, the late Neil Hood. Neil Hood was actually my external, my PhD. And um, I didn't go there because I returned back to Greece for personal reasons that you can see alive and kicking there. <laughs> <laughs> then Tammy Ragmon, my other mentor from University of Gothenburg, Sweden. A very inspiring person. The neighborhood's concept that you, we developed and also his influence, Tamir's influence was also in the various entrepreneurial activities I took because uh, he's a very strong and thinker, which, by the way, I intend to invite him uh, in May to give us a seminar on finance. Fantastic CV, uh, professor of finance, uh, PhD in University of Chicago, Tel Aviv University. He has everything. And last but not least, my darling, Seth Hirsch, again, student of uh, Raymond Vernon, uh, related things to the product cycle. But why all this? Because they wrote very simply. And through their simplicity, they developed uh, concepts that they haven't died and us, as their students, we are still using. All of them, they had the, also one common denominator. They were academics and beyond. They had interests. They didn't just stuck to their papers. I hate it when I go to conferences and they just tell me what the next paper is. I want to see integrated people. I mean, I want to see people that they have interests. And all of them had interests. They were intellectuals. They loved their friends and family. And when I was discussing with Neil and Stephen when they tried to recruit me, was, and I find it fascinating, we were discussing about bicycling. And if I bicycle because they bicycle, and, 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 and I said, of course, and I, I enjoyed it. It was fantastic. And. Um, Thus, their creativity did not come only by looking at regressions, but they had a complete life, and, and they have, obviously. And the other thing I put this list here, if you notice, I didn't put, uh, for instance, Christopher Brackley and Schumacher Gosel independently as bullet points, but together, or Neil Hood and Stephen Young, because it's Papanastasio and Pierce, or Pierce and Papanastasio. Because sometimes they ask me, why with Bob? Because everything that I think is with Bob is, 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 is related to the work we have done. And of course, we have done work independently, but it's the, the issue of ethos. And I would like to think that even Christopher Sumatra Gosal passed away in 2004. One of the latest books came out in 2008, and it's Bartlett, Gosal, and. And I would like to think that it's not a contract with the uh, publishing house, but because Bartlett felt that his work is strongly related with uh, Gosha. And I feel my work is very related uh, with Bob as the Neil and Hood, uh, uh, the Hood and Young uh, duet. So we are the PNP duet. <laughs> Sometimes Pierce and Papanastasio, most of the times Papanastasio and Pierce, <laughs> alphabetical order, because it's longer as well. But I, my co authors, it's, it's wonderful to work with other people as well, obviously, on your own. But I was benefited from all these people in Reading, in CBS, Robert, Bersan Hobdari, Astadisola daughter, 
my PhD student, Evi Sinani, my colleague in uh, Denmark, Fragiskos Filipeos, my PhD student in Athens, Kostantina Kotaridi, Antonis Demos, again my PhD, my colleague in Athens, financial econometrics, Dimitris Manolopoulos, our PhD student, Athens and Reading, Christos Pitelis, we are currently doing work again together, Ruth Rama from Spain, George Anastasopoulos, University of Patras, Helen Lurie, Bank of Greece colleague at the Athens University, Raymond Lufir, National Bank of Greece, Tamara Moor, College of Management in Israel, Niron Hashai, Hebrew University, Dimitropoulos Dimitra, student and uh, researcher in the Ministry of Finance, Bruce Trail, University of Reading, Palaskas uh, Theodosios in Niove, Si Zhang, Tsinghua University, a Bob student, we are doing work on China, Thomakos Dimitris, so far. And I'm sure that in the next uh, presentation, not inaugural, because this is my place now, this is my home, I'm going to mention my colleagues at Middlesex, which you saw before and uh, probably more to come. The institutions, University of Reading, the cradle of international business, said it all, it means obviously a lot to me because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. Athens University of Economics and Business is where I implemented, but it was a struggle. It was a struggle because IB at the time, and as the title says, was a peripheral field. And I was in an international economics department. The right place to be it was multidisciplinary. But my journals, which were the journals that now they are referable, they didn't even exist 10 years ago in any, in any list. So for my colleagues there, I was non-existent. So it was a struggle to survive and to show that, you know, I have an, an, I have an academic criticism, I'm a serious academic. Of course, things did change when I went to Copenhagen, where I was immediately embraced because everybody were talking the same language. And now, Middlesex University, where we can make a distinctive difference in IB slash FDI, because it's interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and we can all work together under this theme. And it's one of the themes that can bring us together. And then it's the European International Business Academy. It's not an institution, but basically I got to know IB through their conferences. And I organized one of the IBA conferences, and now I'm a fellow, and we are working towards making IBA more uh, visible to the world. Because when you are going to these IBA conferences, which is still not huge conference, around now, I mean, 250, 300 people, you could see la creme, la creme de la creme, the best. And the interaction was amazing. And if I am, let's say, a good academic is also because I owe to them. So for me, IBA is one of the institutions that helped me develop. So I will not tire you anymore. I'm concluding. So what is so fascinating about international business? In the book of 1999, uh, the first sentence is the same in Papanastasio and Pierce, we say, creativity remains a core imperative of enterprise and industry, and also a good that of the individual. And in the very last sentence, in the acknowledgement section of our 2009 book, which we dedicated to Jonathan and Katie, Bob's grandchildren, grand nephews and uh, to Paris and Agustina, we say we wish them the freedom and happiness to develop their undoubted talents to the full. So creativity, freedom and happiness is what kept me in uh, IB. I have enjoyed it, doing it. And uh, as I say there, it feels like an explorer. It feels like being my dad. And um, It's a fascinating journey. I'm here on board of the Middlesex uh, University vessel with my colleagues, which are excellent. My students, the PhD students I've met and I've graduated are talented. I have inspiring leadership. And uh, I have the same desire as I started when I was a student 25 years ago. Thank you. <laughs>